This guy is considered the unluckiest driver in Formula One history. But if you look at it from another perspective, you may think of him as the luckiest driver in Formula One history. The man I'm telling you about is Christopher Arthur Ammon and is a driver from New Zealand. Perhaps nobody of you know about this driver and you're probably wondering why he's considered unlucky. Well, the reason is simple. He's remembered for being unlucky because he never won a single Formula One race. Okay, but actually there are hundreds of drivers who never won. Yeah, the thing is that he was super talented, he was racing on very good cars, but every time he was going to win, something bad happened. Christopher Arthur Ramon's story starts way back from Bulls, a town of 600 souls. His parents, get this, run a thriving sheep farm. Chris, however, has nothing to do with sheep. And as early as the age of six, he learns how to drive around the farm. And that was thanks also to his father, who initiated Ammon to this passion. Among the cars that his father bought, there was also a Maserati 250F, which is the same one that won the World Championship with Fangio a few years earlier. And since the beginning, Chris showed off in the local competitions. So, the former champion Rec Parnell brought Chris Hammond to Europe to make his debut in Formula 1. Yeah, because back in those days, that, that's how it worked. <laughs> I mean, back in those days, you just needed to be talented and have a few money to waste. <claps> Formula 1. <laughs> Nowadays, if you don't have 50 million euros, you don't even get close to Formula 1. I made a video about this, where I tell you all the costs about getting Formula 1. Link in the description. Whatever, back to the story. At the time of his debut, he was just 19 years old. So this story seems to be the one of a future world champion. But his debut in Monte Carlo in 1963 immediately gives us a glimpse of his incredible bad luck. Listen to this, Amon was going super fast, but the team leader, the experienced Maurice Trintignant, has a breakdown during practice, so Chris Amon is forced to give his car to the team leader, so Chris is not able to race. Shortly thereafter, Greg Parnell, which is the man who brought into Formula One, which we can call a manager, dies suddenly. And Chris has to do everything by himself, alternating good performances to periods where he can't find a drive. So what happens next? He's taken into his team by his legendary compatriot Bruce McLaren, but there are no money to race in Formula One. So Chris Hammond is forced to race in minor categories. But as I told you in the beginning, Chris is very fast. He has a great talent and he did well in the minor categories. Just to give you an idea, in 1966, Chris Hammond won the 24 hours of Le Mans with Ford. Guys, do you remember that race? That was a legendary race, they also made a movie about that. And yes, one of those drivers was Chris Hammond. So what happens when you win such a legendary race? That in 1967, Enzo Ferrari puts Hammond under contract. Chris Amon is going to be a Ferrari Formula 1 driver alongside with Bandini and Parks. At least this was the plan. Because at the debut in Monte Carlo on May 7th, Chris Amon takes an incredible podium, third place, which actually was one of the saddest podiums in Formula 1. Because his teammate Lorenzo Bandini loses his life in a crash. One month later in Spa also Mike Parks has a terrific accident which puts an end to his career. So the young Chris Simon finds himself in carrying on the entire Ferrari Formula 1 racing team. Paradoxically, this was probably his best racing season. 4 podiums, 20 points and P4 in the championship. Guys, I told you, he was talented and he was destined to be a Formula 1 world champion if it wasn't for his incredible bad luck which now truly emerged. 1968, a series of events, which if you script a movie with them, that would be unbelievable. In Spain, he starts from pole position, he dominates the race for 58 laps, until in the 59th, he blows a fuse. A fuse. I'm talking about a few cents part, which blew and the fuel pump doesn't work anymore. So the car stops and the race is over. Just think that at the end of the race, the mechanic went to the car, just replaced the fuse and drove the car back to the pits. We get to Belgium. Amon once again starts from pole. In the race is in P2, taking the slipstream of Surtees, when suddenly a pebble hits the radiator and Amon is forced to retire. Then we get to Monza. Amon in P2. He's faster than the McLaren had, but he makes one of the worst mistakes in his career. He totally destroys the car and the race is over. At least, luckily, he comes out alive from the car. 
Two weeks later, we get to Canada. Guess what? Amon once more dominates the race. He's in P1 for 72 laps. But the thing is that nobody knows that he's driving with a broken clutch. He is actually doing a miracle, driving those conditions for 72 laps. And guess what? The gearbox breaks. Just think that at the end of the season, a season where he was one of the fastest, he just scored 10 points. But this is just the beginning, 1969. Again, this year, Chris could win in Barcelona, where once more he dominates for 56 laps until, guess what? The engine breaks. Then in Monte Carlo, fighting for the victory, he breaks the gearbox. So, you know, after these turbulent years, in his climate of chaos, Amon decides to leave Ferrari and go to the more competitive Marek. And guess what? It probably was the worst decision of his life. Because from the following years, Ferrari went back to be competitive. And I don't know if you know how was the personality of Enzo Ferrari. Well, if you know him, you can understand that Ferrari was super disappointed by the Amon decision. Just think that Enzo Ferrari considered Chris Amon the best driver on the field, even superior to Niki Lauda. Just to give you an idea about how sensitive and how good Chris Amon was, there is an anecdote, and I'm using an episode which is told about when he worked for Goodyear as a tester. The mechanics, to play a joke on him, pretended to change his tires, but instead put the used tires back on. So Chris Amon did just a couple laps, then he returned to the pits and told them. There are two possibilities. Either you're stupid and you put the same tires back on my car, or you played me a joke and you're bastard. <laughs> And everybody laughed and yeah, that's an anecdote about Chris Amon's skills. However, 1960, Chris Amon racing between Marek and Matra. And in Monte Carlo, Belgium and France, Chris Amon got close to victory, but never made it. Always for incredibly absurd reasons. But perhaps the most absurd one was in 1971 in Monza. Listen to this. He was leading the race, but suddenly at one point, the visor of his helmet came off. So Chris Amo was forced to do the pit stop and change the visor. And the most annoying thing is that that race in the end was won by Peter Gettin, who is perhaps one of the luckiest drivers in Formula 1 because he won one race in Formula 1, that one, and in his whole career, he led the Formula 1 race for just 17 kilometers. And yet he won one race, while Chris Amon led a total amount of 852 kilometers in Formula 1 without ever winning one race. 10 kilometers more than Eddie Irvine, who won four instead. Chris Amon's story is so incredible that the legend says that Mario Andretti said that if Amon opened a funeral home, <laughs> people would stop dying. <laughs> and, and the thing is that it's not over because Amon had one final chance to defeat his curse on July 2nd in 1972 at the Clermont-Ferrand Grand Prix. And I don't know if you know it, Clermont-Ferrand is the French city where the Michelin is born. And that circuit was a very long, fast and dangerous circuit made from the mountain roads. And yeah, racing there was pure madness. And that day, Chris Simon with the Matra, which was not the fastest car on the grid, incredibly scores a pole position, starts the race, takes the lead and is uncatchable. For 20 laps, everything goes as it should. But you know, Chris Amon will never win a Formula 1 race. So guess what? He has a puncture. Amon is forced back to the pits. And we're talking about years where changing a tire in Formula 1 took minutes. They change the tire, Amon is back on track, he does an incredible comeback and he finishes in P3. Listen to this. Now, after that race, this is what Amon said. I will never make it. Never again. There will always be something that on the best of times will break. And indeed, so it was. From that year, racing became worse and worse until in 1976. He said enough, he returned to New Zealand to herd the ships with zero victories in Formula 1 and 852 kilometers led. So we can say that he was the unluckiest driver in Formula 1 history. Okay, but why did I say that he can be considered also the luckiest driver? Chris Amon raced a total amount of 96 races in Formula 1 between 1963 to 1977. Those were extremely fast cars, extremely undrivable and extremely dangerous. Just consider that in the 70s alone, 18 drivers died, while in the 60s, 29 drivers died. Some people say that back in those days, every driver had a 50% chance of dying. So, 
Chris Ammon was probably the unluckiest for never winning a race, but was also the luckiest. Because in every car failure and in every car crash, he always walked out alive from the car. So, what do you think? Was he the unluckiest driver in history or the luckiest one?